heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up from private markets to public, we have got you covered. Databricks raising funds at a $43 billion valuation, while Instacart, and of course, it's filed for its IPO. Details ahead. Plus, Apple revamping the iPad Pro for the first time in half a decade. We'll have more on the iPhone makers' plans to spark growth for the tablet market. And SpaceX's Dragon successfully docks with the International Space Station, marking its seventh human spaceflight mission to the ISS. But what's next for Elon Musk's company? We'll discuss, but first, let's check in on these public markets. And they're here and they're now. The volumes are still thin. It's the end of August. We're down about 25%. But remember how far we've actually fallen in the main benchmarks. In fact, Nasdaq on course for its worst month since, well, the beginning of the year. We're down about 4% today. We're just ebbed a little bit higher, up about four tenths percent. But as I say, low volumes at the moment. The two-year yield stabilizing. We're just down by about one basis point, but still above that five percentage point level. How fast we have run up in terms of those borrowing costs. Now, of course, all eyes on what China is trying to do to stoke its economy at the moment. And it managed to fizzle out a little bit in terms of Chinese trading. They put some emphasis in trying to support the economy. And we are seeing that pull over a little bit into some of those Chinese names that are traded here in the United States. But again, it has fallen off hard over the last few trading days. Today, we stabilize on the Nasdaq Golden Dragon. I'm seeing up more than two percentage points. Some of those internet names traded here. Let's move on and look at what's happening in the world of crypto, because remember, that took a tumble in the last couple of weeks. And I want to shine a light on the fact that we are actually stabilizing at a new level, it feels like, Ed. We've come down 11 percent from that 30, 29,000 level. We are now, though, just in a range bound. 26,000 seems to be your number at the moment, as we have all eyes on the macro policy perspective. But go into the micro for a moment. Yeah, no crazy moves for specific names, but there are tech stories from all over the world. So Xpong, Chinese EV maker, nice bit of M&A buying DD's smart auto business. That seems to be supporting the US listed shares or ADRs for that Chinese EV name. Apple's basically flat now, but later in the program, Mark Gurman's going to bring us his latest power on. He's giving us reporting about the next gen iPad Pro coming 2024, some new specs that we're looking out for. Two other names moving related largely to analyst calls, but I want to bring you a new name we haven't discussed on the show, which is Nerdy, ticker NRDY. Why am I picking out Nerdy? You know why because I'm nerdy, but it's an, e an education online platform. Raymond James reinitiating with an outperform. Lots of growth, it thinks, because it's moving to a subscription model powered by, guess what, AI. NVIDIA has been resumed by another, uh, or initiated, sorry, with another buy rating at Sealand Securities. The story last week, remember, was that it finally sort of shaken off its last sell rating. We continue to see sell side names bullish on NVIDIA as the AI leader in semis. Those are the public sort of stories and movers that we're looking at in the private space, Databricks, the closely held software maker, widely viewed as a candidate to go public, is in discussions with T. Rowe Price about a new funding round that would value the company at $43 billion. That, according to Bloomberg sources, Bloomberg's Katie Roof with us. She has that story. Katie, what other details do we have? Sure, yeah. So as we reported, that T. Rowe Price is in talks to potentially lead an investment that would be an up round at $43 billion. We don't see a lot of those these days. It was last valued around $38 billion in 2021. Um, you know, there aren't a lot of pre-IPO companies that can even raise at all, let alone at an increased valuation. But, you know, a lot of people are drawing comparisons to, to Snowflake, which is almost a $50 billion company. Um, um, Databricks also has been getting more involved in artificial intelligence, which is obviously a hot space. They recently acquired Mosaic, um, an artificial intelligence business that targets enterprises for over a billion dollars. And so uh, what we understand is they've had a lot of inbound interest with investors trying to invest, trying to get in what could be the last round before they go public. And yeah, it's looking like it could fall at $43 billion. Well, well, let's dig into that a bit deeper. This is interesting timing. Because a lot of companies that are now in the IPO discussion may have done a down round in the last two years. But they're raising or they're looking to do something at this interesting valuation pre-IPO. What, what do we know about Databricks' near-term intentions to go public? 
So, you know, usually I would say if a company is, is raising money, they're not on the verge of IPO because you don't want to dilute your ownership right ahead of an IPO. Um, so this, to me, is a signal that they might be delaying their IPO further. Now, Databricks obviously is a company at scale. They have the kind of revenue that's necessary to go public, but they also don't have to go public because they're able to keep, you know, raising capital in the private markets. And so um, they just haven't, they don't have that impression, that pressure just yet, but certainly they are a company that we expect to go public at some point, someday. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all wait with bated breath as to the reopening of the IPO market. We've got Arm, of course, waiting. We've got the likes of Instacart, where we got the details, the devil in the detail, coming in their latest numbers in the filing of the IPO on Friday. What did we learn from that overall, Katie? Right, so we've got Arm, Instacart, Clavio, all of them came out with IPO filings last week. It's going to be busy for, for tech IPOs. Um, Instacart was interesting. You know, I, I had mentioned the other day on, a, on Bloomberg TV, I was hearing that their financials were better than what people were thinking, and it turns out uh, they were profitable. They had, you know, revenue growth and managed to, to make money, which is pretty rare for tech companies and newly public tech companies. So that surprised some folks, but what we learned is is um, they're, they're getting a strategic investment from PepsiCo of $175 million, so obviously that's a vote of confidence in the industry. But we also learned that they've made a shift in their business model, or they've, they've added new lines of business. They've, they've really been focusing on e-commerce technology, um, software that can help um, with logistics and other analytics, and, and also focused on advertisers. So they're really expanding beyond just uh, giving you groceries, which they absolutely still do. Fujisimo really coming into bear when it comes to the leadership of that company. We thank you so much, Katie Roof there, really detailing some of the news we've got Friday and then throughout the weekend. Let's carry it on a little bit in terms of well, what the IPO market's gearing itself for. Rachel Goering, we're pleased to say, joins us. Look, she's been leading the IPO practice over at Ernst & Young Americas. You've got 20 years' experience in really guiding companies at this pivotal moment in their direction of travel. I know we won't dwell on individual names and individual business models, but ultimately when we're seeing a company like Instacart that's had to put off going public, had to take cuts to its market valuation, how important is this moment? I think it's a really important moment for the, the broader IPO market and particularly the tech IPO market. Um, it's certainly a predictable way of um, having a market reopening occur um, with the anticipated deals that everyone is expecting over the coming weeks. And you know, there, there's three common thing, things that these companies are sharing that um, are coming to market right now. One, um, and it, you all were just speaking of this, profitability, scale, and then name brand recognition. These are all factors that investors are finding important in today's um, environment and placing a premium on. Uh, Rachel, good morning to you from San Francisco. Look, it, it, from a news cycle perspective, a lot seems to have happened since Arm made its move. If Arm makes the jump and lists, do you think mechanically lots of listings will follow in quick succession? It's kind of like a game of brinkmanship. Who can jump first and see if the others will follow? I don't know that it's one company that's going to make um, a massive reopening, um, but it's certainly um, a start that we need to have occur. But like I said, what investors are really paying close attention to right now and are rewarding are companies that are profitable um, or, if not yet profitable, a very clear path to profitability. So we're not in that growth at all cost environment that we were, you know, just 18, 24 months ago. So it's those companies that are going to really lead the way um, in paving the way for the next entrance of IPO aspirants. You know, Caroline, there are two sides of the table in any transaction. And you and I know quite a few venture capitalists that really want this to happen, really want this window to open. <laughs> yeah, boy, they've been waiting for these exits. It can't all be about m and and there's not much of that either. And Rachel, to that point, we're hearing that there is a lot of stress in the venture capital environment, and a lot of them have raised huge funds that they're now desperately trying to allocate in this environment as well. What did you make of the fact that Databricks, a big company in the private market, is also able to raise in the private environment at the moment? Where do you think the real rubber meets the road for some of these companies that can still fundraise, perhaps not going for an IPO at this moment? Yeah, well, I mean, a few things that it tells me. One, um, 
there is money to be deployed out there, but venture capitalists, investors broadly are being very discerning on where they deploy that capital. So um, investing in companies that um, they feel have a strong growth story, um, the, the merits behind the transaction are being very much um, reviewed and, and so forth. So we're not seeing the, the volumes of investments that we have seen before, but we're seeing very targeted um, interest, particularly around key technologies such as AI and so forth. So there continues to be a strong investor focus in that. Investors focused on AI. How focused are you on China and the impact of the Chinese economy on confidence? Well, the, the geopolitical tensions are continuing to be there. Um, still, I can speak more to the U.S. market and the, the U.S. market is very dominant, um, continue to be, you know, the, the, the place that most companies want to, to list. And companies are going to still continue to navigate the, the broader geopolitical environment, um, as well as many other factors that have been impacting companies for the past 24 months. Rachel Gehring, IPO leader at Ernst & Young Americas. Great insight. And finally, a bit of activity in this space. Good to have you on the program. Now, sticking with some food delivery platforms, DoorDash is looking to speed up ordering and help customers find food options with an AI-based chatbot. The company's working on a system called Dash AI that it's testing in a limited capacity in some markets. Evidence of the technology was first discovered in DoorDash's iPhone app by developer Steve Moser and later shared with Bloomberg News. Now, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, Apple betting on a revamped iPad Pro to spice up the tablet market. Power on, Mark Gurman. We have all those details next. This is Bloomberg. Foxconn founder Terry Goa has joined a crowded race to become Taiwan's next president. In the process, upending an election that will have wide-ranging implications for security in the Western Pacific. The tech billionaire denied Beijing could pressure him through his extensive operations in the country, which include much of Apple's supply chain. Speaking of Apple, the company working on a revamped iPad Pro for next year, its first major overhaul of that product in half a decade. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. You brought us those details in the latest Power On. The key bit for me is M3 chip, right? Every time they have a new generation of chip, they have more uh, CPU cores, more graphics cores, more memory. But this is a major hardware overhaul. This is a major hardware overhaul. I mean, as you know, the iPad market, or more generally the tablet market, has been in a bit of a funk lately, right? Shipments for the overall tablet market were down 30% year over year in the second quarter. Uh, iPad revenue has been down uh, several quarters in a row. Actually, in the third quarter, iPad revenue was its lowest since the cusp of the pandemic in the beginning of 2020. Apple is really hoping that this new iPad Pro, uh, which will come out in the first half of next year, 2024, will sort of rejuvenate sales with a new design. They're going to be moving, this is the most significant thing, I think, to OLED displays for the first time in an iPad. If you remember the move from LCD to OLED uh, in the iPhone 10 in 2017, it's a really significant change. So now the iPhone and the iPad will use the same screen technology. That's gonna be a really robust upgrade. Uh, that M3 chip you mentioned, but also more laptop-like capabilities. There's going to be a new Magic Keyboard attachment. They'll probably price it anywhere between $300 and $400, but it'll essentially turn your iPad into a laptop. Mm -hmm. This new version will likely have a function row at the top, like a Mac, and it'll also have a bigger trackpad. So this is clearly going to be aimed at iPad power users, and I'm excited to get my hands on one as well. Mark, how many other people are excited to get their hands on iPads at the moment? Because it has been an area that just hasn't been firing, firing on all cylinders for Apple. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, anyone who's a big iPad Pro user and has had an iPad since 2018, that was the last time they redesigned the iPad Pro. We're coming up on five years, right? They introduced that in October of 2018. So we'll get this big revamp within five years of that window. So I think anyone on a 2018 model or even a 2020 model uh, like myself could be looking to upgrade to this next generation. So I think they're going to get a pretty significant upgrade cycle, at least for an iPad, uh, for, this, for this new range. 
If you go on Apple's website and you click on the iPad section and you put compare, there is just infinite possibilities, Mark. There are so many iPads. They all are quite similar and very different. And you write in Power On that that's been a bit of a tricky situation for Apple. Well, when you're a customer, right, and you're not ingrained in this ecosystem like I may be or, or you two might be, you really don't know what to buy. And a lot of these iPads are, are very similar or they're very differentiated by a couple hundred dollars but with very minor tweaks in between. So it's unclear if you should buy the, the base 10th generation iPad. Should you buy the 11 inch iPad Pro? Should you buy the iPad Air, right? And so I'm not sure that this new iPad Pro will do much to fix that problem with perhaps too many iPads, too many choices, and lack of clarity between the, two, the, the many options. But what it will do is it'll help differentiate the iPad Pro and make that more of a halo product at the top of the line and maybe push more people to the high end which of course would raise overall Apple ASPs and overall Apple revenue. At a time where we question maybe some costs going up for Apple as it has to rejig a mark its entire supply chain, you did a really great deep dive, Bloomberg did in its big take, about how much th this is really changing the environment for making this equipment across the whole of Asia, not just China. Yeah, the interesting thing about what we've discovered based on the data is something we've been talking about or I've been talking about for a long time. Apple is not necessarily moving out of China, but it's augmenting its operation outside of China. So you're not seeing many new product lines being developed in China. You're seeing a lot of status quo in China. So the number of suppliers in China for Apple, the number of production sites, it has, it has stayed stagnant, right? It hasn't really gone down. But in terms of Apple's growth, all that growth, that's happening in Vietnam, that's happening in India, the new lower end iPhone models. You're seeing a lot of production in India as they need additional units for those regions. You're seeing production in India. You're seeing Apple Watch production in places like Vietnam. You're seeing new types of Macs being produced in Malaysia. So you're seeing China sort of stay stagnant for Apple, but not growing, right? So the future of Apple production and supply chain is in China. It's the places around China. It's the Indias of the world, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, Thailand to a lesser extent. Uh, there's some work being done in Japan, right? So that's really the story here. China, Apple China, that's staying the same, but all that growth that's happening elsewhere. Really interesting, Mark. Thank you so much. It's great to have you back, Mark Gurman, on all things Apple and its supply chain. Now, just focusing in on the supply chain, of course, all of this comes amid a geopolitical tension of US and China. And we know that earlier, US Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo was meeting with her Chinese counterpart. It's all part of the Biden administration's effort to well, try and reduce some of the tensions between the world's two largest economies. China, it says it was a frank meeting, a constructive meeting, talking about tariffs, talking about chip policy. Rondo, of course, had been looking to stabilize the relations. Just take a listen to what she said before. We agreed to establish a new commercial issues working group, a formal working group, which will involve US and Chinese government officials and very importantly, U.S. and Chinese commercial private sector representatives as we seek solutions on trade and investment issues and to advance U.S. commercial interests in China. I understand they're going to be meeting at least once a year. Now, coming up, let's talk Bitcoin. It's like a teenager, in need of its sugar high, according to Bloomberg Intelligence. We'll have all the details next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time now for Talking Tech. First up, SoftBank. Well, it's going to take a group of its Indian startup founders to Silicon Valley. That's next month for an AI tour. Now, this is all as the Japanese investor is stepping up its efforts to really infuse its portfolio companies with the technology. Meanwhile, Xpeng shares they soared after it agreed to buy Didi's smart car development arm. Now, the deal both eliminates a potential competitor in the crowded EV market and gives its tech-savvy partner a new venture. Plus, more on EVs now. Japan's advanced electric battery technology company, Noko Noko, is now trading on the Nasdaq. It plans to enter the domestic leasing business with EVs that use its battery separator technology to help improve longevity and heat resistance. Ed, I know that's all of your focus point in EVs, but now we're going to some of my focus point, right? 
Yeah, and let me take you back to 2017. That's when Bitcoin first reached its current level relative to the NASDAQ 100 stock index. The question, can crypto now outperform? A Bloomberg intelligence note out today says it's unlikely. Federal funds futures in one year hovering around 5% and deflating producer prices are very different from that past easy money day that Bitcoin grew up in. Let's bring in Mike McGlone from BI, who wrote this peak. And Mike, you write in your latest note, Bitcoin's a teenager and may miss its sugar high. What are you talking about? Well, hello. Um, I, I think, guess you can appreciate I've raised a few teenagers <laughs> that are no adults. But the bottom line in all marks is never forget from where you're from and what got you there. So we, I look over at that two-year note every day, and I see it's a giant sucking sound for risk assets, and Bitcoin's one of the riskiest assets. And Bitcoin's whole premise, its whole, t- whole lifetime, it's been under a zero or very low interest rate environment. Now interest rates are very high and attractive. So then I look at performance. How, far, how much has Bitcoin performed? Well, okay, the best in history. If you look at the first time it traded a dollar, that was around 2011, it's up 26,000 times that. So to me, the risk is greater that Bitcoin continues to revert lower. And all indications are showing that. It's showing divergent weakness versus the stock market, particularly in Q3. And then you pointed out versus the NASDAQ. It's still at the same level since 2017 in the NASDAQ. And I look at it, it's a much higher volatility asset. And it's showing diverge, It's showing lack of performance to really take it out. It's higher. So I look at it as, OK, risks are tilted lower, particularly if we look at it, what the Fed's doing. Um, yeah. We don't see any liquidity coming from the Fed. And if they keep tightening, what stops them from tightening? Potentially the stock market going down, which means most risk assets. Mike, another Mike that I was speaking to this weekend all about that sucking sound was Mike Novogratz, of course, of Galaxy Digital. Yeah. And he's been getting more concerned about some of the headwinds, even though he himself is in line to be getting one of these spot ETFs. So too was Kathy Wood, and I was on stage with her as well. I'm interested as to what, if any, tailwinds could make you change your opinion on this. Yes, we need some kind of change. But first of all, I think I have better hair than, Ms., than Mr. Novo. The, the significance, the first sign of tailwinds is I need to see, let's, let's see, at least see some signs, signs of strength. So right now, all the big picture moving averages are tilting lower, like the 100-week moving average. The market's bumped up to there and it's heading lower. And it's doing for a good reason. It sees that Fed fund future still tightening in the future. I need to see some divergent st- strength maybe versus stock market weakness. That would be a good sign. We're not seeing that now. Mike McClellan of Bloomberg Intelligence. We love some of the headlines that you have on your Bloomberg Intelligence notes. And it was a great one today. We thank you on all things crypto. From New York, from Miami, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. A quick check in on the markets. I think it's important to think about this on a weekly basis, right? So NASDAQ 100 is it's a little bit higher, two-tenths of one percent. We're coming off a strong week last week where the NASDAQ 100 posted a gain of around one and a half percent, but it snapped three straight weeks of losses. And it was the first time this year we'd seen that. This week, on the weekly basis, we just have a flood of economic data from around the world. Here in the U.S., hard data and sort of more soft data that we're tracking everything from PCE, the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation, through to other gauges of manufacturing confidence and activity and economic check data out of China. And increasingly, when we worry about tech, we are worried about China as kind of the engine room of the global economy. Here's an interesting one for you as well. We talked about DoorDash and its AI efforts, a new one out this Monday morning, an AI-powered voice assistant. Now, it's really interesting because in the statement, DoorDash is an app, right? But they're saying that so many people still phone in their food orders, but the restaurant's too busy to answer the phone. Here's their solution. Get AI to do it. They're saying that 50% of all calls are missed. So now they're trying in multiple languages an AI-powered system. You phone up, the AI interacts with you. It's just in trial phase right now. It had boosted the stock earlier in the session, but we're softer by three-tenths of 1%. More AI. More AI. More on DoorDash for a little bit as well, Ed. Let's talk about a competitor that's about to go public. I'm talking, of course, of Instacart. We want to get back to the conversation all around this year's IPOs. We're all bracing for them. Greg Martin, I'm pleased to say, co-founder and managing director of Rainmaker Securities, which specializes in pre-IPO investing. You're also, of course, still an active VC, Greg, and, and much experience uh, in prior history of working with these sort of companies to build them up for this moment. I'm interested, DoorDash, of course, what, five to six times 
overall focus on, on in terms of active user base compared to Instacart. That's what the Bloomberg Intelligence note is telling us today. How are you looking at the prospectus? How are you looking at the filings and thinking, ah, oh, but it's profitable? You know, Instacart will most certainly always be compared to DoorDash. Um, and, th and thank you for having me this morning. Um, but it is it is different in, in, in a few important ways. You know, it's it has a pretty significant advertising business, which is very profitable, mm -hmm. very high margin. In fact, actually, um, even larger than Uber's uh, advertising business. So I think that's a big distinguishing factor. They obviously they don't have the same kind of order order growth as as DoorDash has, which I think is one potential, uh, you know, low light of the business, but they've been able to increase transaction fees uh, per user and per order, um, which, which has enabled them, despite flat order uh, growth in the first half of 2023, it's enabled them to actually grow their transaction revenues by 31%. Um, you know, if you look at their revenues, they probably project to be around 3 billion in 2023. Um, with with better margins than way better margins than DoorDash. You know, if you look at DoorDash's uh, you know revenue multiple, it's in the three and a half times range. So it probably portends an IPO offering for Instacart, assuming they're able to make it to the finish line in the ten to you know twelve billion valuation range, um, mm -hmm. which I think would you know be an appropriate uh, level relative to where DoorDash sits. Of course, what Instacart did, unlike some currently private companies, is they took that bitter pill. They decided to slash their overall, overall valuation in the private market and then some. Has that been important? How much pent-up demand is there from public investors now for this sort of a name? What are you seeing on your platform? Well, it was a necessary uh, reduction in valuation. Their last private round was in the 39 billion range. Um, you know, they kind of slashed their slashed their internal valuation to to around 10 billion, um, which which frankly gives their employees who were you know issued options, any recent investors, um, and most likely any uh, public market investors upside. Um, so they, you know, I think it was important for them to level set, and frankly, they didn't have a choice. The market spoke to them. And that's where the valuation is is more appropriate. Um, I do I do think it it bodes well for public offering. I mean, the company is demonstrating solid growth, solid profitability. You know, they've talked about ways in which AI is going to help them. And if you look at our platform at Rainmaker, where we handle a very large volume of of private secondary transactions, um, we're starting to see orders come in, um, which is reflecting you know strong demand for you know a potential IPO that you know in 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 several weeks, mm. um, people often like to get in now because they think there's going to be upside, uh, you know, from the IPO price and beyond. And of course, we await roadshows. And I mean, Ed, it's going to be a busy start to September when you think of all these bankers yeah. and companies having to hit the road to explain their stories because it's not the only IPO. You know, what's astonishing to me is on this program, we've been talking about how dead, frozen, inactive the market is, and all of the news flows happen in just seven days. Greg, Arm filed. August 21st, how much was that a starting gun for you to kickstart the rest of the, of the, the window? It was a big starting gun. I, you know, if you look at, if you take a little bit of a step back, I think one of the sort of, you know, starting guns started with Kava. I think Kava was an eye opener for a lot of people. It was a sort of a, a quiet company that, that traded up significantly on its IPO and has actually held up pretty well, close to 100% since it, since it priced. You know, then you had Oddity Technology, and then you had obviously VinFast, which has been on a, a huge, a huge soaring climb this last week. So I think people see that there's receptivity in the IPO markets, and I think what started as a trickle could end up turning into a flood. Obviously, last week we had Arm, we had Instacart, we had Clavio. Um, those are much bigger IPOs. So I think there'll be a bigger test of where the market really is. Um, you know, Arm is more of a flat company, but it's also telling you know an AI story. You know, as you see, you know, kind of riding the coattails of NVIDIA. So, you know, I think ARM will be interesting. Instacart will also be a large IPO. I mean, we're talking probably, you know, several billion plus of proceeds between the two companies. So I think these will be real tests for the market. But I think they're both strong companies with good stories. And, you know, I expect if, if, they, if they succeed, and I do think bankers will probably still try and be conservative in pricing because they want to show that there's an uptick in, for buyers who take the risk of buying an IPO, that we might actually start seeing the floodgates open again. Um, yeah. And we have several other companies that are ready to go if they see that happen. 
I had a cup of tea the other day with a tech banker and we talked about Carver and I said, that's not a tech company. <laughs> and the banker made the point that it is a growth company, though. And so you can see how investors treat a growth name. Interesting signal. Caroline made a really excellent point earlier in the show. Databricks has raised money, right? At an interesting valuation. Is that a signal that they won't IPO? Why raise and, and negotiate up with your investors ahead of a listing? You know, it's not necessarily an indication. Um, you know, they have, they're one of the few companies that has been continually investing, even through the downturn. Um, they have such a huge market in front of them. Uh, you know, they're a significant AI company, a significant data company, similar to Snowflake. They compete with Snowflake. They have massive scale, massive growth potential. So I view them as a company that, you know, could go public whenever. It may portend more likely a direct listing when they go public because they may not need to raise capital, but they may just want to create liquidity for mm. their investors and shareholders. So I wouldn't necessarily say it means they're not going public. I think, you know, they will always take the position that we will go public when the market is right for us. And if I think if they see a really buoyant, IPO market with some of these IPOs that we've discussed, I actually think they might go sooner than later. Greg, I'm interested as to the hunger for this and who it's from. Who is coming to your platform to get ahead of the listing? Who is going to be there to take down this listing? Which kind of investors are interested at this moment? You know, we're starting to see all manners. I mean, for, you know, for 18 months, everybody kind of retreated other than, other than the investors that had a pure mandate to only do late stage private secondaries. We're now starting to see the big IPO buyers, and obviously we're we're, we're hearing of of, a, of the Databricks investment. Um, you know, we're we're starting to see the big institutions. We're starting to see family offices. Um, we're starting to see, frankly, high net worth individuals. Um, we're starting to see a big flow of people that are are just are just there to say, hey, I, I don't want to miss the next Kava. I don't want to miss the next Vinfast. I don't want to miss the next Oddity. So. So I think as, as investors search for yield, and you know, remember the bar is high. The, the risk-free yield now is five to six percent versus zero. Yes. So it has to be a quality IPO to entice investors to come in at this point. And Greg, I'm going to go to a sensitive sort of topic in the VC space right now. And you are still one. You've got Archer Venture Capital, of course. You were at Redpoint before. There is this really interesting dynamic that's happened: is that all these VC companies have raised a ton of money. They need to put that to work. They don't want to particularly have to give money back to LPs. I'm just interested as to what tensions are being felt in the venture community in the space right now as they are looking to have these liquidity moments and then also try and find where to put money to work. We saw T. Rowe Price interested in, of course, Databricks, but that's a crossover name. Yeah, I mean, the biggest tension, if you look at you know, the, uh, the, the pandemic in 2021, there was a real grow, 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 spend, spend, spend mentality. And so a lot of their winners were, were created huge burn rates and were consuming cash at an alarming rate. And so the first order of business for venture capitalists is to make sure that your big, you know, scaling businesses that are also spending a lot of money are well capitalized. And because they went through massive burn, you're seeing a ton of reserve and frankly, you know, a retrenchment uh, on new investments for venture capitalists to make sure they're supporting these companies. So there's not a lot of new investments into new companies, but there's a lot of using this capital to make sure that your big scale businesses have the cash. And of course, they're also making sure they're not spending money at, at the same rate. But obviously, there was an expectation that uh, there would be a lot of liquidity by now. You know, there was an expectation these companies would pu be public. And now they're seeing, hey, the RP IPO bar is raised. Um, we need two or three more years to get these companies to an exit. And we need to make sure we have the capital in these businesses to sustain those businesses so they can grow, frankly, into the, into the crazy valuations that they were raised at in 2021. Greg, you mentioned the attractiveness of the yield on benchmark notes impacting IPOs. What's the biggest quickly economic factor that, that you take into account right now? Interest rates are always number one when you think about growth business and tech businesses are, are mostly valued as growth businesses. So when the 10-year goes from 150 to 430 basis points, um, you know, that's, that's, that's really significant. That crushes multiples, and we obviously saw it in 2022 in terms of the NASDAQ, even though it's up a little bit since then. So interest rate sensitivity is very high. 
And you know, we're we're at a high point on the ten year. So I think people are 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 really focused on are we gonna have a declining interest rate environment and when? Or, you know, we're all obviously all paying close attention to the September Fed meeting mm. where a lot of us are expecting things are still going up. I mean, inflation's still out there and we're not hearing, you know, that the Fed yeah. is ready to start lowering rates. And boy, have we got a big week in terms of economic data, even though we've got thin volumes out there still now. Greg Martin, brilliant. From macro to micro, the co-founder and managing director of Rainmaker Securities, of course, still very active in the venture space with Archer Venture Capital, too. Coming up, look, we'll talk tech, investing for the fastest growing demographic in the world. It's the older generation. Abby Melalevy of Primetime Partners joining us next. This is Bloomberg Technology. I think you have to like healthcare just because of the generational trade that's going on. The world is getting older. Sarah Hunt Alpine Woods there. And really the focus on generational shifts at the moment. It's going to be the focus of our VC spotlight today. We're focusing on investing in the technology that's driving innovation for that fastest growing demographic in the country and in the world, it's the aging population. I'm really pleased to welcome to the show Abby Miller-Levy, co-founder and managing partner of Primetime Partners, an early stage venture capital fund that invests in people and companies that transform quality of life for older adults. And at this moment, when clearly the need is there, when clearly big companies are thinking of the benefits to support those that are supporting the older generation as well, is it okay? Is it, what are valuations like in that space right now to be allocating to? Well, I'm so glad you guys are spending time on this topic. Uh, the, we do proceed to Series A investing. And one of the best things about being an early stage investor is that valuations have stayed sane <laughs> through the crazy bubble, if you will, of 2021. Uh, what we're seeing at the later stage is that the valuations really are sticking somewhat formulaically to what healthcare services and healthcare IT typically are, which is anywhere from four to 10 times. And so within that, there's quite a wide range, mm -hmm. but the valuations haven't yet become so uh, astronomical, largely because most of what we do is invest in healthcare related businesses. And there still is usually a human component to a lot of what we do. Because when you're w working with an older population, uh, with healthcare delivery, uh, we're not talking about robots here, we're talking about human to human. And so a lot of those valuations stay within the four to 10 times because of that. What's interesting though is that there are a number of your portfolio companies, I'm sure, that are currently trying to understand how artificial intelligence can yes. make them a little less dependent on the human, or indeed you've already invested in companies that MO is AI. Is that becoming a theme even more? Absolutely so? becoming a theme. It's not at the point where AI is replacing medical professionals and clinical decisions, but it's absolutely an enablement tool. For example, one of our portfolio companies called Duos, they work with health plans to engage their members to understand what benefits they have both within the plan as well as the $30 billion of unused federal government benefits. And they're using AI really from a personalization perspective to make sure they're delivering the right recommendations. So we see a lot of AI around personalization. We see AI a ton on diagnostics. One of our portfolio companies, Kintsugi, can diagnose depression in older adults using uh, their voice. Not natural language processing, but actually voice vibrations. And so AI is helping them there. Within dementia care and diagnostics there, um, you know, as you know, that population is about to blossom. Um, we're seeing a lot of AI on the diagnostic side. We do not invest in healthcare discovery, uh, drug discovery. But that is a huge piece of innovation in drug discovery and the speed of drug discovery is AI. So we're seeing really AI as an enablement mm -hmm. of the ability to scale healthcare to this population that, as the, uh, you mentioned before, is you know, doubling in size. So the population in the US of people over 65 is about 16% of our, of our US population and we expect it to jump to 22% by 2040, according to the US Department of Health and Human Services. You're a VC with a long time horizon to invest. How do you ride along the trend? How do you make sure that you're invested in parts that follow it? So there's one piece of it, which is you've got this doubling of the older population on a global scale. 
And that absolutely creates huge infrastructure challenges for healthcare, for financial services, for housing. And so you've got these very big issues, almost like climate change, where the data's always been there, people are finally waking up to this seismic shift in the de demography. But what's happening is really the urgent needs of large Fortune 100 healthcare companies, which is they need to take costs out of the system. U.S. healthcare spend is 18% of our GDP. We have the most expensive healthcare system in the entire world. So what we're investing in are businesses that help take costs out today. So for example, fall prevention, number one reason why older adults go to the hospital, one in four older Americans will fall, uh, and yes. that creates $50 billion of cost in our healthcare system. You prevent one fall, that's a tremendous value. So businesses we invest in like Bold or Rosarium from Home Improvement, uh, these are businesses that really help take costs out of the system today. Abby, are there any areas you stay away from? You just think, don't do that, don't invest. This might be a contrarian point of view, but uh, we think when people talk about the tech-enabled home, uh, while 90% of Americans want to age in place, the answer isn't necessarily to make everything kind of like the Jetsons. Uh, I guess I'm d displaying my age here, where everything is robots and technology and answered by the cloud that we believe that that is an area where remote patient monitoring and home care in the home is a great place to invest, but fully digitized robotic solutions, we're just not there yet, and that's not really the type of care that humans want for themselves and older adult children want for their parents. We love a contrarian view. Abby, thank you very much indeed. It's been a joy having you in to talk about this particular part of the space. Abby Miller, Levy, of course, she's of prime time partners. All things venture. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. All right, let's head to space. The Crew Dragon spacecraft launched by SpaceX successfully docked with the International Space Station over the weekend. The docking took place while the two spacecrafts were orbiting above Australia as its crew of four astronauts began their six-month mission. Bloomberg News space reporter Lauren Grush here with more. Lauren, it's getting routine, but, but tell us about this mission. Yes, speaking of routine, it was the seventh operational crewed flight crewed flight for SpaceX through NASA's commercial crew program. They hold an ongoing contract to send astronauts to the International Space Station for the space agency. And this crew was a very international crew. There was a NASA astronaut, a European astronaut, a Japanese astronaut, and a Russian cosmonaut. So it really just kind of encapsulates what NASA is trying to do with these launches by sending up partner astronauts and NASA astronauts. What's SpaceX going to be doing with all of this activity as well, Lauren? Well, and now that they've launched their latest crew, it's time for the recent crew that they launched up roughly six months ago to come home. So in a yeah. week, Crew 6 will be returning to Earth in their own Crew Dragon capsule after they greet and, and make the new incoming crew feel right at home. Yeah, Lauren, you broke some news Friday that Starship, the explosion in April, had big environmental impact. Quickly summarize your reporting. Yeah, so there's quite a lot going in space, but plenty going on down here on Earth as well. So uh, a lot of people might remember the SpaceX uh, Starship test launch in April. Well, we did a Freedom of Information Act request uh, looking at, uh, you know, information that we could gather between SpaceX officials and the Fish and Wildlife Service in the aftermath of that launch because it, it was quite uh, explosive and it was quite destructive. And it, we got 1,100 uh, pages of yeah. emails and photos, giving us a really candid look at how those officials with the Fish and Wildlife Service, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. were kind of a dog at what happened after that flight. Almost four acres of state park burned. We, Lauren, amazing piece of reporting there. Lauren Grush, we thank you. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Yeah, huge week ahead. Recap on the podcast wherever you get your podcast. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>